you and I met a number of years ago at some event in New York City. Yeah. We ended up uh, partying. <laughs> we ended up partying afterward. Tur turns out we we both love music and, and going out. Um, and uh, but so obviously that's the Daba I know and the one I've had the chance to meet a couple of times. But I wanna I wanna go back in time. Uh -huh. And I would love for you to share a little bit about the upbringing. So you, where was it that you were born? And give me a little layout of, of the, how the town, the look of it, and the people, the community. What, what did that look like? Well, basically, I was born in 1982, which was still during the time of apartheid, was mm -hmm. still in control of, of, of the government of the country. So I was born in Soweto, which is a township outside of the city. Um, and it was a township that was actually created by the apartheid system because they removed black people from staying in the cities. The labor was getting too competitive between the whites and the blacks. So in order for them to control it and take advantage of it, they removed all black people to stay outside of the city. And so they created Soweto, which is an acronym for Southwestern Township, S-O-W-E-T-O, mm. Southwestern Townships. And that was mainly a black community, more, mainly obviously, there were some sort of uh, middle class people, but majority were, were poor. Um, yeah, and it was just- How big, the, how big at that time? More I mean, like, at that time, there was probably 1.5 million people. Oh, wow. Today, okay. it's closer to 3 million. It's over 2.5, it's about 2.5 million people today. And so you grew up there and you grew up, did you brothers, sisters, tell me about the siblings and. So, yeah, I mean, I have an older brother, but I only met him um, when he came, cause he, he, my mother, my, my father and his mother divorced. And then my father uh, married my mother. Mm -hmm. Azondi then had me and my two younger brothers. So when I grew up actually, um, I grew up alone and then my brother arrived nine years later. He's nine years younger than me. Did you have imaginary friends? No, actually, you know, because, <laughs> <laughs> because we're in the community, because we're in the hood, everybody, your neighbors then become your friends, your neighbor's kids. Got it. You know, it's okay. being in the hood, everybody knows everybody on the street. So you can go over and, and borrow sugar or tomato sauce or, you know, hey, can we get some rice or whatever the case may be. So they'll always, you know, parents will always be sending you back and forth. I say that because my older brother grew up in a farm. That's where we grew up with. Okay. And uh, he obviously, before my two older brothers came, came into this, I mean, before me and my middle brother came into this world, he, he had some imaginary friends. And I think that's, uh, yeah. oh yeah. And I think he had, I he had, a, name. He had a name for them. Uh, and I think oh, it wow. was when he had like, he created his like fifth imaginary friend when my parents were like, <laughs> all right, this kid's going to grow up fucked up. We need to, we need to like, <laughs> we need to, we need to bring in two more kids because he's, he's nuts. Uh, so, uh, so good. You didn't, you didn't need imaginary friends. Yeah, you, you had, also. you had your, uh, and so you said, uh, tell me, so in the community, obviously it's very, it sounds very tight knit, right? So, yeah, I mean, mainly we played marbles to be honest with you. And we played soccer. Marbles and soccer. Yeah. Holy crap, man. I think that's a foreign thing. I did marbles <laughs> and soccer too. We call it peakies. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I, uh, yeah. I lost a lot of games and I got in debt. I, I think got... I won more than I lost. Oh yeah. Good. Yeah. Did you bet? Did you like put any? No, we never bet. We never bet. Okay. Uh, but we did play. Uh, there's this other game that you play. It's like gambling, but you play with coins, and you spin the coins, and then you put it flat on your on your on like on your on your hand. Yeah. And somebody has to basically slide a coin and guess if it's head or tails. Wow. And if, and if they guess the same, they win. But then if they guess differently, you take his coin. Whoa. That is, that's, uh, that's another level for me, man. I stuck to, I stuck <laughs> to the marbles and my brothers, <laughs> actually my par my parents got, uh, they were, they were worried at one point because my grandma, my grandfather from my dad's side, uh, was, or I guess his grandfather. So my great grandfather was a big gambler. Okay. And, uh, and at the age of like five, I got into playing peakies, like most of the kids our age. 
Nice. But I bet and I sucked. <laughs> and my brothers had to pay my debt. Damn. And it, got, it got so bad that even my brothers couldn't pay my debt. Damn. You know? And I had to speak to my parents, man. I had to be like, look, it's fine, but a lot of kids are looking for me. So I'm going to need your help. <laughs> and they actually bought like beakies so that I, like the next day in school, I had to like give out all this stuff. Ah, uh, pay your debts. All right. So you didn't, you didn't have to, uh, you didn't have to go through that. No, nah, I didn't lose too many. Oh, good for you, man. Good yeah. You. you knew, you knew your talent. You stuck to your talents. Well, the thing is we, we played for fun most of the time, more than betting. You see, right. so at, at home, when there's nothing to do, if it's raining or whatever, you play marbles. So you're always constantly practicing and getting better and better. Right. Yeah, so yeah. When I played out in the public, i most of the time win. So you came back to Soweto. You continued living your life, just like yeah, a normal kid. life. Normal life. Normal life in Soweto. Yeah. And then you mentioned, so that was in 1990. So three years later was when your grandfather decided to, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to grab you. I'm going to grab your parents. They're going to go here, right? Was that like in 93? Is that what you I'm going to take my grandson in to live with me, and I'm going to send my son, his parents, to university. Got it. And how did you feel about that? How, how... Again, in the African family, you don't ask questions. You so do you just... as you're told. So he sent his driver to come fetch me. I told the driver I couldn't go with him. And he tried and tried to get me to go with him. I said, no. And then when my father came home, I told him what happened. My father said, if he comes again, you must go with him. I said, fine. The man came back three, four days later. I went with him. And that weekend, I found out that I'm going to stay with my grandfather and my parents are going to university. Brother, yes. Thank you. Yes, dad. Yes, dad. Yes, dad. There's no questions. You do as you told, my friend. Wow. And then you got there. And what was, do you remember the first time you're like walking in the house, you're seeing your grandfather? Well, first of all, you, you pull up to the house, a gate opens, a security, you walk in, there's security, there's cars, there's just people everywhere. It's a big ass house, it's a mansion. And then you get there, at this stage, you haven't really, aside from like in the afternoon, getting to meet him for the first time, uh, how, how was that interaction? Like how, how did that go about? I mean, very formal. You know, hi, how are you? Uh, are you hungry? Do you want to eat? You know? Who else um, was there? Did he have, I mean, did you have other people? No, the people who were there, the staff. So it was your grandfather? Did, so no other cousin? The guy who does the, the garden, uh, the security, the drivers, yeah. And no other cousins or like grandkids or anything? No. It was just you? Yeah. Wow. Okay, so you get there. How are you? Are you hungry? get something to eat, and that was the beginning. And that's how you began developing a relationship with your grandfather. Mm -hmm. When did you have, were there certain times? So how did the, like, was dinner you and him and a table and you guys are just yeah. having dinner? That's yeah. what it was? Yeah. Wow. How, tell me about, like, was he, was he playful? In the sense of the way you kind of do, did he speak down in the way that most adults, every adult does with kids? You know what I mean? Like, no, oh. no, no. I mean, I was already 11 years old by then. Okay. Which, so, I mean, still, a, you're still a kid. And I'm uh, taller than the average kid. So I'm a big boy. Um, and his main concern is school. Okay. What you need for school, how you perform at school. And that was the basis of our conversation for the first couple of years. Wow. So it was always so that. That's much, how it so began. Not much conversation. It's not like me and him were big buddies or anything like that. <laughs> the grandfather, I'm the grandson. You do your work at school. That's the most important thing is to is focus at school, get good grades. That's your number one responsibility. And at this stage, living with him, where did you go to school then? You switched schools or? No, nah, I went to the same school. <clears throat> you went to the same. What school was that? The same school, Sacred Heart College. Okay. This is the Maris Brothers College, a Catholic school. Did you like school? No, not really. You know, um, I went to school. Was still, I think there was eight black boys in our in our in our, in our standard. Yeah. I uh, was still the minority. Oh, really? And Wait, I was well, very... how, how many? How many? So, eight black boys, but I mean, like, how many people were in the? There's probably that, about twenty-five. Twenty-five. 
in a class. And eight were black. And there's three classes on that grade. I mean, three, yeah, three classes of that grade. So there will be grade 2S, grade 2E, grade 2F. Got you. Yeah. So maybe my class is two or three black boys. The other class is two or three there. You know what I mean? Was, was racism already apparent when you got there? Was that, a, was, I mean? Yes, of course. You know, kids learn from, from home and they bring whatever they learn to school and it comes out on the playground. <clears throat> wow. So you and already so saw that. We ended up having a gang where the gang it was all the eight black boys and we used to fight against the white boys every break and after school. Which meant eight of you versus like, 20. <laughs> yeah, <pretty much. laughs> that's what, that's your first introduction to boxing yeah, right there. Yeah, right uh, there. Wow. That's insane. And did, um, did you develop cool relationships with people at that age that you still have now or no? Yes. All the, all the guys that I was friends with, I'm still friends with now. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Well, although those are still in touch with, I mean, there's like two guys that we don't know where they are, but everybody else is, is still with us. That you're, that you're still, oh, that's great. And yeah. how were you in school? So you, you didn't like it that much? Yeah, that, so I was very average school, very average at school. Did you try escaping? Yeah. Huh? Did you try and escape or no? No, you can't. Where you oh, okay. to? I, I, I tried to escape three times in my school. Well, where, uh, the thing is, you can't really escape at our school. Where are you going to go? Well, let's just say I didn't plan it out so well. All right. Oh, so like, <laughs> you're like, you're wearing where, are uniform, you, bro. where are you going to go? You're wearing uniform. So the minute you go outside of school, where are you going to? Yeah. Well, that and was the first. People recognize that you're wearing uniform and you're supposed to be at school during those hours. I, I was uh, five or six. I hated school. It was private school, Catholic, same thing in Colombia. And it was gated. You had huge gates. Yeah, yeah. And uh, till this day, my brothers can recollect getting like their teacher to bring them outside i would somehow because we grew up in a farm we were very good at climbing trees like i was yeah you, know, you see you see something that has nothing to grab on and you're like yeah. I, can, I can climb that yeah um, and uh yeah so like for three th three consecutive times i tried uh escaping school and my brothers were called in and i was like on top of the gate like moving it like screaming for my parents uh so i feel your pain I feel your pain uh, about school, but you never uh, tried to escape. It seems like you, uh, you were a little more intelligent in the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> where am I, what am I going to do afterwards? What university did you go to? I went to University of Johannesburg. Johannesburg. Okay. Yes. And that is, that's the university in... Well, no, there's, there's UJ, there's Wits University. So those are the two main universities. Got it. Wits, those are, and UJ are most like prestigious university in terms of the quality of your education. And then, of course, there's a number of others. Got it. And, and uh, why, why that one? I, I know that there's like two or three more, but why that particular well, one? Well, you have to try it. I mean, obviously, you have to apply to all the universities. Okay, you do. And that yeah. one, you got in and... Yeah, I had to write an entrance exam and I got in. The others, I, I couldn't actually get into the others. Got it. So you got I into that one. that good. But this one... My grades were like on the borderline of entry, so I had to write an entry exam. Were you, uh, most of this was what? You weren't motivated. I mean. I, I didn't want to be at school, to be honest with you. I wanted to take a gap year, but, you know, you tell your, try to tell your black parents about a gap year. <laughs> they ain't having none of that. You want right. to take a gap year and do what? And just. Mm -hmm. yeah. and Find yourself? What? <laughs> what? Boy, you better go get your ass to school. <laughs> I'm wasting my time. <laughs> oh, that's good. How how did that come about? Where where did Africa so Rising? Africa Rising came about because we were tired of the image, the stereotypical misconception that Africa is only a place of war, poverty, and disease. And we thought we needed to do something about it. And we, we decided to form an organization that would focus on the positive image of Africa, to try and regain the control of the narrative that exists on Africa, to make sure that international media are not the ones owning the narrative on Africa, but Africans are owning the narrative that exists on Africa. And that began around 2010. So we've been doing it for seven years now. <clears throat> Was there a particular moment that 
the inspiration came about? The real inspiration, Alejandro, came from me traveling to different cities around the world and realizing that people had very limited knowledge in Africa. You, get, you go somewhere, hey, how are you? My name is Daba, I'm from South Africa. Oh, from South Africa. Oh, how big do the lions get? Oh, my God. I'm like, listen, bro, I have no idea. I don't work at the zoo. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, you're from South Africa. I heard it's so dangerous there. I need to come with security. Mm -hmm. I'm like, listen, my grandfather's a president. I don't have security. I think you'll be just fine. Wow. Wow. Um, and, you know, eventually, 2009, there was a concert here in New York at um, um, 4 double sixes for concert, and another question was posed, and that's when I decided something has to be done about this image of Africa. You decided that pissed you off, and you're like, okay, I want to do something about it. So yeah. Africa Rising came about. Was this you and a couple people? or? Yeah, so basically me and my cousin went back home and we called, I called colleagues from work. I had just started in Invest Tech. Um, Greg called some of his buddies and everybody came together and we discussed this thing and we realized actually that this was on the minds of a lot of youth in Africa. It wasn't just, you know, between me and my cousin who were able, who were privileged enough to travel. You know, this is what, you know, the thinking of young people was in general. And so we were just lucky to, you know, work with the people that we work with and get them on board and they had felt the same way. So we started Africa Riser. But what are you up to now? Let's, let's, maybe let's, let's my, talk about... My main two things is Africa Rising and agriculture business. I got into agricultural business last year. Agricultural. And that's because, so Africa Rising, I believe has three, it's three pillars that focus on entrepreneurship, on education and yeah. on culture. Yes. And where, where does the, the agriculture, can you share a little bit about how that comes together? So basically, um, I, last year, I approached a friend of mine to, because one of the issues in our village, because we focus mainly on our village, is agriculture, right? It's farming. We have a lot of land. A lot of families have livestock. They plant their own stuff. It's very rural communities. And so I realized there was a need for us to help these farmers, to help these households. And so through speaking to my friend who works with the Japanese seed company called Sakata, he made me realize that, listen, Daba, we can push a number of projects that can also bring us money, but doing good at the same time. Of course. Right? So what we started was a project called Million Food Gardens for Mandela, where we are now going around corporates in South Africa and asking them to sponsor tins of seeds that we can then distribute together with the Department of rural development and agriculture to these rural communities. So our idea is that we want to be able to get corporates and individuals to purchase 1 million tins of food, mm -hmm. right, of vegetable seeds that we're going to distribute to a million households around the country. And so we started this project last year. Wow. So we basically got a couple of these tins donated. Um, we had a demonstration at, at our house in Kono in the village. Mm -hmm. And then we worked with the Department of Agriculture and, uh, and Rural Development to distribute these. So this year we've already managed to get British American tobacco to buy 20,000 tins of seeds, which we then donated wow. to the department to distribute. Wow. This is, in food of, um, and this is in light of food inflation. Food inflation in South Africa last year reached 9%. So it's become increasingly difficult for the poor people to afford food and to encourage them at least to plant vegetables so that they can obviously cut that budget and have more money to spend at the grocery store. I saw a number of videos of you in, um, in high schools and, and uh, yes. I don't know, elementary schools, and you were saying uh, you would greet them and have them repeat certain phrases. And I thought that was incredible. I thought that was really inspirational uh, where Thank you, you, it's part of the fighting against the perception that yes. these kids are, are receiving daily yes. from EDM from them. And do you remember, or can you share a little bit? What, what is it that you do there when, when you meet these kids? So basically, you know, our whole thing, you know, in terms of, breaking down this misconception that exists, we want to actually increase the confidence and pride in young Africans. 
so that when they travel and when they engage with the visitors, they talk about Africa with a certain level of pride and confidence. And so when I speak to the kids, I want them to walk away saying, wow, I'm an African. I know what it means to be an African, and I am proud of it. And actually, that man encouraged me to dream, to dream big, and made me realize I can achieve those dreams and make them a reality. Mm -hmm. And how do you go about when you, and when you go to the schools, what do you do? I basically give a small speech, and then I ask them to repeat after me afterwards with their hands in the air, you know, to say that, ladies and gentlemen. Can I do it? Role, I want to do it. Okay, so I say, put up your hands like this. Okay. Right? Repeat after me. I am an African. I am an African. I am proud to be an African. I am proud to be an African. I am proud of my mother and father. I am proud of my mother and father. And I thank my teachers for spending their time to teach me knowledge. And I thank my teachers for spending the time to teach me knowledge. Therefore, I will make sure that I do what I can. Therefore, I will make sure that I do what I can. To make this world a better place. To make this world a better place. Together. Together. We can achieve anything. We can achieve anything. That's it. Wow. I love it. I love it. By the way, why, uh, why the hands this particular way? Have you seen that in other cultures? My grandfather you... started that. Oh, really? Yes. And it's basically to say... I am in control of my destiny and my hands as what well is going to create a better world. Oh, what are you up to now in New York City? What's New York City? I've got two speaking engagements this week on the 12th and 13th um, at uh, colleges. So I'll be doing that. I'm, I've got a total of about five speaking engagements here in New York City. I have one in Atlanta. I'll also be meeting with my agent and my writer because I'm writing a book which will be released next year. What's, uh, what's the book about? The book is going to be called Lessons from My Grandfather. Great title. And, and basically, I'm taking his teachings, his values and principles, and I'm applying them to the new generation in the 21st century. How, do they, how are they relevant in today's world? Can you give us a snippet? What is, what is, uh, what is something, what is one lesson that, uh, that you came across from, from being with your grandfather or from seeing or being inspired? Well, one thing that really my grandfather really um, uh, appreciated mm -hmm. was humility. The power of being a humble leader. That is one of the things that, you know, my grandfather saw that could really make a profound leader because when you are humble, people will be able to relate to you in a way like no other. Is there a particular memory with your grandfather that is something that you cherish, that is very dear to you because it meant, for whatever it was, it doesn't have to be a lesson or it doesn't, was there something that comes to mind in terms of uh, a happy memory? Yes, of course. I mean, you know, what immediately comes to mind is when I graduated uh, from the University of Pretoria and my grandfather attended that graduation, you know, that was a very proud moment for me. Um, that he came there, and of course, you can imagine when my grandfather comes to any event, um, he becomes the, the showstopper. Right. right? right. Uh, and walking out of there and taking pictures in front of the, you know, my colleagues and you know, university staff and professors, etc. That was definitely one of the proudest days of my life. That's awesome. Have there been very certain moments that are really? that were very hard, that you needed your family to be there? Yes, of course. I think one of the most difficult periods of my life was when our grandfather passed away. Um, when my mother passed away, when my father passed away. Um, those are definitely the lowest points in my life. Very when difficult, very challenging, and I wouldn't have been able to do it without the family. When did your, your parents pass away when you were... Uh, this was 2003 or something like yeah, that? Yeah, my mother passed away in 2003, my father in 2005. Wow. And I, I, I believe this also ties into one of the biggest, in, one of the initiatives that you support nonstop, which is HIV, correct? Yes, yes. I mean, they were both taken by HIV AIDS. Um, and so, 
you know, since then I've been uh, working with the United Nations HIV AIDS uh, to work on obviously, you know, breaking down this epidemic and making sure that people empower themselves, you know, um, obviously using condom as much as, as, as often as possible. Those who are not married, of course, um, and making sure you, you, you limit your partner. So one partner, but ultimately, you know, what's important is also to make sure that you know your status. A lot of people don't know their status. People are scared to find their status. And that is why this epidemic is still spreading is because people refuse to go and get tested, you know, and, um, if without knowing your status, you can't really empower yourself. So even if you use condoms, because we all know condoms are 99% proof. Sometimes they tear. Right. There's all sorts of issues. So the most important thing is really to know your status and to make sure that you're using protection every time you engage in sex. What if uh, someone out there right now that wants to do something um, for your cause, for Africa Rising, where, where can they go or what, what could they do? Yeah, well, you can hit me up on Ndaba mm -hmm. at arfoundation.co. I'm on Twitter, Ndaba Mandela. Uh, also, Africa Rising Org, one word, Africa Rising ORG, one word on Twitter. On Facebook, my personal is Ndaba Mandela, and we also have the Africa Rising Foundation on Facebook as well. Um, so, even on uh, Instagram, Ndaba Mandela, and uh, for Africa Rising, it's Africa Rising Org as well on Instagram. So any of these platforms you can reach us on.